Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Leitner Observatory Tuesday night public night live stream. I'm Michael Faison. I'm the director of the Leitner Observatory and I teach in the astronomy department at Yale. Thanks to everyone joining us here on the live stream. I am actually uh, not at the observatory tonight. You can see from the live observing deck camera that uh, it's a bit cloudy and it's also not dark yet. Uh, so since I'm not doing telescopes tonight, I thought I would uh, run the live stream from home tonight. So I'm in my home office um, with my cat <laughs> and uh, my beverage here. <laughs> and uh, I hear my son going to bed in the getting ready for bed in the next room. But uh, happy to be here to chat with you about astronomy and take your questions. Uh, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about what's up in the sky this week. Uh, and uh, have to see if you have any questions about anything that's going on. And uh, then we have a special guest speaker. We have uh, senior Yale grad student Richard Grosh here to talk about uh, black holes and machine learning. So we'll throw over to Aritra in just a few minutes. So get your questions about uh, black holes ready. Um, so it's also, by the way, notice it's not very dark outside right now. This is a live view from the observatory. Uh, it's not very dark right now. And of course, that's partly because we're heading into spring, right? So we have spring equinox this Saturday. So the sun is setting later. Uh, but also, of course, we just had to switch to daylight saving time uh, when the government forces everyone to get up an hour earlier. Uh, so that there's more sunlight uh, for you to enjoy after work or after school or whatever. Um, I'm pretty uh, opposed to daylight saving time. I think it's a terrible idea. Doesn't save daylight, doesn't save energy, but uh, <laughs> it's the law, so we have to do it. Um, so I think starting next week, uh, we'll move the live stream a little bit later on Tuesdays, maybe eight o'clock or 8.30 when uh, it's dark enough so that when it's clear, we can actually see things uh, through the telescope. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to type your questions in the YouTube live chat, and I'll try to keep an eye on the live chat. And if I see any uh, questions, I'll try and uh, pause and <laughs> take your questions about astronomy or the Leitner Observatory or black holes or uh, anything that's going on. Uh, as I said a couple of times, normally on Tuesday nights, we open up to the public and do planetarium shows. And if it's clear, we set up telescopes for observing. So uh, hopefully we'll get back to that a little bit later this year. And in the meantime, we're doing these Tuesday night live streams uh, with uh, astronomy, astronomy Q&A, uh, what's up in the sky, astronomy news, um, research at Yale, research at the Leitner Observatory. And then when it's clear, I'll set up telescopes outside for live streaming a video from the telescopes. Uh, I'm hoping as it gets warmer that uh, I'll be able to actually go out to the observing deck and set up telescopes and move them around for you and do some demonstrations about how to use telescopes. And uh, I have some plans to do some demonstrations on uh, uh, what kind of telescopes you might start with if you're interested in getting into astronomy and you're thinking about buying a telescope. What's a, what's a good type of telescope to look at? Maybe what's a good specific telescope? to look at. Um, so look forward to that. Uh, look forward to those uh, live streams coming up uh, in a few weeks when it's warmer. OK, well, let me talk briefly about what's up in the sky, and then we'll move on to our main discussion about black holes. So I'm going to put away my, I'm going to put away my security camera and go to the sky chart for today. So uh, this is the evening sky map from skymaps.com that I've shown uh, a couple of times. And uh, I've talked in the past about the bright, bright winter stars, the bright winter constellations you can see of Orion and Sirius and the two bright stars, uh, Pollux and Castor and Gemini, Capella, Aldebaran, and so forth. And then the nice little star cluster, the Pleiades, over a little bit to the west of uh, Taurus. Now, as we go deeper into spring, uh, each night, the stars appear to move a little bit to the west, a little bit to the west. Um, so over the course of about two weeks, uh, they're all, they're all going to rise and set an hour earlier uh, in the day. 
Uh, so over the course of a month, everything's going to rise and set about two hours uh, earlier. So we end up seeing some of these spring constellations coming up higher and higher as the sun sets. So we're starting to see Leo actually higher in the sky uh, at sunset. Uh, Mars is now right between uh, Taurus and the Pleiades. I was looking at it two nights ago. I was looking at it on Sunday night and you can actually definitely see it moving uh, through the stars of Taurus. Um, and then that asteroid that I've been talking about, uh, the bright asteroid Vesta is in Leo. And I can actually show you this in the sky simulator here in just a moment. Uh, in terms of uh, events coming up here, let me, uh, let me hide my video so you can see the calendar behind me. In terms of events coming up, uh, not a lot uh, coming up in the rest of March. So we have, um, we had our new moon uh, last weekend, and then we have a first quarter moon on Sunday. So that's March 21st. Spring equinox is on Saturday. Uh, so definitely worth celebrating. Um, and then uh, I don't see any other interesting um, alignments or meteor showers or anything coming up. Full moon then at the end of the month. And this will be what we call the Paschal moon, this full moon on March 28th. So the way that uh, we determine the date of Easter is actually you wait for the spring equinox and then you look for the next full moon. And then the next Sunday after the next full moon uh, is Easter. So it changes every year. And believe it or not, it's based on astronomy. It's, Easter is always the Sunday after the full moon after the spring equinox. You'll never have Easter uh, before the spring equinox. That's the absolute er earliest uh, it could happen. I, you could have a situation, I suppose, where you have uh, the spring equinox on the 20th of March and a full moon on the same day. And then the next Sunday would be Easter, maybe the next day. Uh, so that's the earliest you could have it would be March 21st. And then the latest it could happen would be a month after that. Uh, this full moon, though, it looks like it's going to be a super moon because uh, not only is the moon full on March 28th, but uh, the moon is, you can see that right there, uh, the moon is at perigee on March 30th. So perigee is the point in the moon's orbit when it's closest uh, to the Earth. So that's when it's going to look biggest in the sky. And they actually tell you the distance here, 3,600 kilometers. Um, and the size, 33 uh, minutes of arc. So that's about half a degree, a little bit bigger than half a degree. So yeah, this is pretty close to a supermoon. They're not happening, happening on exactly the same day, but close enough that that would be called a supermoon. Let me demonstrate the sky in Stellarium. So I've talked about this a few times. This is software you can download for your own computer from stellarium.org. And if I switch over to Stellarium, I can show you a simulation of what the sky looks like right now. So uh, again, let me hide my, my camera. I don't have my green screen here in my office at home, so uh, I can't blend in as easily with the video. Uh, but you see a nice crescent moon tonight. If it were clear, uh, we'd definitely look at that through the telescope. Um, if it's clear tomorrow night or the next night, go outside right at sunset and take a look to the west. In fact, I can show you what the sky uh, would look like Tomorrow night, there's the sky tomorrow night, a little bit more illuminated moon, but a little bit later in the evening, we can see the stars coming out. And uh, there we have Mars, the Pleiades, and the stars of Taurus the bull. And uh, I encourage you to look for these uh, spring constellations that are coming up over here in the east. So look for Leo the lion, right? So Leo, you can find the bright star Regulus right here and look for the backwards question mark of the front of Leo and then the right triangle that makes up the back of Leo. Um, look for the Big Dipper over here in the northeast sky. The Big Dipper actually helps you find other stars and constellations. The two stars at the end of the cup famously point to Polaris, the North Star. Uh, let's see, bring myself back up here. So the two stars at the end of the cup famously point to Polaris, the North Star, which is right there. And then uh, if you actually go in the other direction, if you use these two stars, get them there. If you use these two stars and go in the other direction, they point to Regulus. So if you want to be sure that you're finding Leo the lion, um, you can find the, find, uh, the Big Dipper and uh, go over in that direction and you should be able to find it. Uh, Vesta is still visible with binoculars and there it is right there kind of between the 
brighter stars in the um, right triangle. So Vesta has been moving sort of up. They sort of keep it centered here. It's been moving kind of up and to the right, sort of up and to the west relative to the background stars. So I've been tracking it with my uh, digital camera and it's gonna be visible for about another month or so before the Earth gets far enough away from it that you really won't be able to see it anymore um, with binoculars or with a small telescope. Okay. So uh, I think it's gonna be cloudy the next couple of days. We might have some rain tomorrow. So uh, do watch for clear nights uh, this week and go out and look for some of these stars and constellations and look for the uh, waxing moon going from crescent to first quarter uh, to full until the 28th and uh, look for Mars as it creeps to the east relative to uh, the stars in Taurus. All right, I'm going to get rid of uh, some of this stuff on my computer that I don't need anymore. Here's the view at the uh, observatory again, and I see the lights have turned on out on the observing deck. Uh, let me get rid of this window here. And I'm going to go to Eritrea, whom I have on a Zoom call. Let me just make sure. All right. There he is. <laughs> Hello. Hi. How are you? Hey, Michael. Doing fine. Thank you. So thanks for coming on the live stream. Uh, tell us a little bit of who you are, and then we'll get into your presentation that you brought about your research. And then we'll do a bunch of Q&A. Yeah, so. sure. Uh, I'm hello. I'm Oritra Ghosh. I'm a fourth year PhD candidate in the Department of Astronomy. I work with uh, Professor Meg Yuri primarily on how black holes and galaxies co evolve with each other, and I use machine learning in my work. If you have been to the observatory like pre pandemic, you might used to do shows there before that, so you might have run into me as well. So I kind of do these other things as well, along with my research, and very happy to be able to do this. Uh, remotely today. Yeah. yeah, you've done a lot of planetarium shows and outreach events and TA'd. You've TA'd for me several times in some of my classes. Uh, so yeah, uh, frequent guest, frequent visitor to the observatory. So let me jump out of the way and I'll let you talk about black holes and then I'll come back uh, in a few minutes and uh, we can talk some more. Okay. Sure. I will go ahead and share my screen. Yes, I think it's working. Okay. So, uh, as I said, I will be talking to all of you today about how black holes affect the evolution of galaxies and how we have been using machine learning to study this process. And to begin, let me start with a very broad overview of what galaxies and black holes uh, actually are. Just like our own galaxy, the Milky Way, there are many, many galaxies out there. And galaxies come in a variety of different shapes and sizes, as you can see from this beautiful montage of images on your screens. And one of the major things that we have uncovered in astronomy over the last two decades is that most galaxies, which are on the heavier side, have a supermassive black hole at their center. And let me draw your attention to this acronym that I'll be pretty much using throughout the talk, SMBH, which just refers to supermassive black hole. And this notation, which might also come back uh, when we write something like this, what we're trying to refer to is M star refers to the mass of the sun. So 10 to the power 10 M, M star essentially just means we are referring to the object, referring to something which is 10 billion times more massive than the sun. Okay, so now I told you that most galaxies which are very heavy host a supermassive black hole at their center. But you may come back at me and ask, okay, but aren't supermassive black holes such that light doesn't escape from them? So how do we even see these black holes? And you'd be correct. Supermassive black holes are these extreme objects. Uh, and a nice way to think about them is you can think of a star which is about a billion times more massive than our own sun. 
and it is squeezed into an area which, is, which has the diameter of New York City. And although Newtonian physics breaks down at these uh, regimes of gravity, if you think about a Newtonian's formula for the gravitational fields, if you have a very high mass and if you have a very low radius, then the gravitational field becomes immensely high. And it is due to this extreme gravitational field that even light cannot escape a black hole. But even the light cannot escape a black hole, we can still see black holes. And that is due to this gas, which is surrounding a black hole within the galaxy. This interstellar gas collapses into a black hole due to the attraction of a black hole. And to visualize, visualize this process, let's take a look at this simulation over here. And what the simulation is showing is at the center, there is a black hole. And you can see all this gas, which is around the black hole, which is gas, which is present in the galaxy. We all commonly refer to this as interstellar gas, collapsing into the black hole due to the gravitational pull of the black hole. And as the gas collapses into the black hole, it forms this disk, which is often referred to as the accretion disk of the black hole. And within the accretion disk, due to the high pressure, the friction and everything, the hot plasma that it creates emits at a variety of different wavelengths. And thus, although we cannot see that black hole itself, this interstellar gas, which forms this accretion disk, is visible. And what essentially happens is that as this accretion process goes on, uh, as I was telling you that the disk radiates at a variety of different wavelengths, starting from visible light to gamma rays and also to radio. So at these variety of different wavelengths, we can see this intense process happening. And to look at each of these different wavelength regions, we have a variety of facilities up in the sky, both up in the sky and then on the ground, which allows us to look at these specific wavelength brackets. For example, with the Hubble Space Telescope, we can look at the visual region with the Chandra, with the Chandra Space Telescope, we can look at X-rays. So essentially this tells us how active the black hole is. And as just summarizing, so although no light can escape the gravity of a supermassive black hole, uh, the accretion of matter around the black hole allows, that, allows us to see the black hole still. Now, one interesting fact is the same process which allows us to see the black hole also ends up having a, a major impact on the evolution of these galaxies. And to understand this process, let's again look at a bunch of other simulations. And what I will show over here is you will see, so these simulations contain a black hole at the center of the image, and then you have the gas surrounding the black hole. And these different panels over here are tracking different things related to the gas. For example, this is temperature, this is pressure, and a bunch of other things. Don't worry about too much what each panel is tracking. Instead, try to look at the motion of the gas once I start the animation in a second. And what you can see over here is this intense process as the black hole grows and it uh, devours the gas, the interstellar gas around it, it also creates these shock waves, which kind of spread throughout uh, the galaxy, the interim galaxy. And so essentially these active black holes while eating up the gas, these during phases of extreme accretion, we prefer to refer to them as active galactic nuclei or AGN. They release large amounts of energy, which affect the surrounding gas in the galaxy. And because it is from this same gas that stars are usually formed, this extreme activity going around a black hole ends up affecting star formation in the galaxy. And thus, black holes end up playing a major role in how galaxies, and therefore the entire universe, how it evolves over time. And this process is commonly what we refer to as AGN feedback. And although over the last two decades, we have definitely found evidence of AGN feedback out there, uh, an accurate understanding of exactly how, when, and why supermassive black holes affect the evolutionary pathway of their host galaxies remains one of the major outstanding questions in modern astrophysics. So till now, I've told you that supermassive black holes can be found at the center of galaxies and they affect these galaxies due to the process of accretion. Now let's get into the question of why do we care about the shapes of different galaxies as I was referring to at the beginning of my presentation. Now galaxies come in a variety of different shapes. However, two very common shapes that people try to distinguish between 
are these galaxies which are dominated by these disks. So we call them disk dominated galaxies. I'll refer to them as disk dominated for the rest of the talk. And there are the other galaxies which are more elliptical galaxies and they are dominated by a bulge. So I'll refer to them as bulge dominated galaxies. Now we care about the morphology of a galaxy not only because different shapes, some you may prefer one shape over the other, but because the morphology of a galaxy holds clue to the past history of a galaxy. And to understand that, let's again look at another simulation. And what you see in this simulation is that there is a disk galaxy over here and another disk galaxy will come in from here in a second and it'll collide with the other galaxy. And watch closely as this process of collision happens. And these two galaxies will now do a little gravitational dance with each other, as you will see. But what finally ends up happening is there is no sign of the disk galaxy anymore after the two galaxies have merged. So we essentially started with two galaxies which looked like this and ended up with a galaxy which looks like this. And this is not something which is happening by chance in the simulation. This happens most of the time. So disk dominated galaxies do not survive major mergers. And therefore, if you see a disk dominated galaxy, you can be pretty sure that it did not have a major merger. On the other hand, if you see a bulge dominated galaxy, it might have had a major merger in its past, in its recent past. So essentially summarizing, the morphology, the present morphology of a galaxy holds clues to the, to the past history of the galaxy. And another interesting fact is that these mergers, due to the process of the gas gets thrown around a lot and it creates uh, a lot of different things at the center of the merger, these mergers may also trigger AGM, the active galactic nuclei, these active black holes that I was talking about. So studying the morphology of a galaxy can give us these different insights into the evolutionary pathway of galaxies. Till now, I've been talking to you about these single galaxies, but to understand how this process works over time or how this impacts the entirety of the universe, we need to study large samples. And to demonstrate the process to you, let me start with a slide showing uh, a brief history of the universe. So we started about 13 billion years ago with the Big Bang. And after that, we had the first stars forming and you had a few remnant black holes. And since then, you have had black holes and galaxies evolving together. One very interesting aspect of astronomy is that when you look at further distances, you are essentially looking further back in time. For example, let's say this gets, let's say we are over here from in our Milky Way observing galaxies. And let's say this galaxy over here is about five light years away from us, from our Milky Way galaxy. When I say something is five light years away, it means that light takes five years to travel from that galaxy to our own galaxy. And so essentially how you're looking at the galaxy right now is how the galaxy looked like five years ago because it takes like five years to just travel to you. And so essentially one of the very cool things that we can do is when we look at galaxies further away, we are essentially looking at how the galaxy actually looked in the past. And so essentially by looking at galaxies further and further away, we can uh, try to understand the past history or how the universe has evolved over time. And to do that, we specifically use different kinds of telescopes as I was uh, talking about. For example, the Chandra telescope helps us see X-rays, Hubble Space Telescope ha helps us to see optical light. And by looking at galaxies further and further away, we essentially try to look in the past. And then we try to un answer or ask rather different questions, ask and answer different questions. For example, how many galaxies are there which are disdominated, bulge dominated? Uh, how many of these host an active galactic nuclei that is an active black hole? And how much X-ray are we detecting from these galaxies, which tells us about the level of activity in these black holes? And again, what is the status of star formation in these galaxies? Because as I was talking to you earlier, these active galactic nuclei can often affect the star formation happening in a galaxy. And what we do is we ask these questions at different instances of time, at different evolutionary stages of the universe. And we also do not ask this question for a single galaxy or two galaxies or three galaxies, but we ask them for large numbers of galaxies at each of these different temporal points. 
And then asking these questions at different points of time helps us gain an evolutionary perspective of what has happened, how we reached our present day, where uh, galaxies and black holes have evolved together. And asking these questions essentially helps us glimpse into the past in a way. Now I've established to you why we need to look at large samples of galaxies. And let's talk a little bit about the amount of data that we have been collecting in astronomy. So the need for machine learning in astronomy is really driven by the amount of data that has been uh, collecting over astronomy, uh, that we have been collecting in astronomy and how it is going to explode in the next decade, the amount of data. So as you can see from this graph over here, and I will point to you that the Y scale is log. So essentially each uh, point is about 10 times the previous point. As you can see over the next decade, the amount of data that we generate every single night is going to grow by at least a hundred times more, the amount of data that we now generate every night. So this sheer amount of data that we will have will be impossible to be analyzed using traditional techniques that we have been using. For example, to understand the morphology of galaxies, we traditionally would fit a light profile that will fit a model to the light profile of the galaxy, or we'll use citizen science projects like Galaxy Zoo, where we ask citizen scientists to classify galaxies. And both of these techniques will still be out there and they'll be used for their niche techniques. But if you are going to do a large sample surveys, like uh, over a large number of galaxies, you will need almost, you will need to employ data science techniques, aka machine learning, to deal with this large amount of data. And the specific machine learning technique that we use, that we use for our own work here are convolutional neural networks. And so let's uh, try to understand what artificial neural networks are. And so essentially let's do this small experiment uh, where I will try to draw something and you will have, you'll have 20 seconds to guess uh, what I'm drawing. So get ready to type this answer into the chat. And I know Michael told me that it takes about, there's a seven second delay or something in how the live stream happens. So this might not exactly work out, but I'm hoping if no one else can point out, Michael can quickly jump in and uh, tell me what I'm trying to draw over here. So I will start drawing and I will also start the clock. And as soon as you have understood what it is, type it into the chat and Michael will have a look at it. And if no one can answer that, Michael will step in and answer. So. Uh, I'll try to draw. Hopefully this works. Let's begin. So I, I, I don't know whether I'm not monitoring the chat, so Michael, I will ask you to uh, kind of tell me if someone said something or what do you think this is? Yeah, I threw, I threw in some, some, <laughs> some answers. My first answer was a basketball. Uh, <laughs> and then I think you drew like the crossbar there. <laughs> and uh, as someone who's an avid cyclist, I'm not quite sure I would describe it as a bicycle, but... Uh... <laughs> Uh, I think that might be what you're going for there. Either, or maybe two tr two unicycles uh, glued together. <laughs> glued together, yeah. So, <laughs> so Michael got at the, thank you, thank you, Michael, for stepping in. So Michael got at the crux of the matter. So essentially, if you drew this diagram, and if I showed this to you, many people, most people would say, oh, this is a bicycle. And, but if I show you actually how a bicycle looks like, this, as Michael pointed out, this does not, totally look like a bicycle because bicycle will have these different collection of uh, these rods over here, which kind of look, which are not present in my diagram. But if you were to show this diagram to anyone else, their brain would go, oh, bicycle. So, and it's very hard to recognize when this happens in real time. But what is happening over here is that the multiple visual cortexes in your brain, which contains hundreds of millions of neurons, which interconnected by billions of connections between them, this has learned over time to abstract visual input. So you have seen these images, but you don't always remember the exact details and you instead store them as high level concepts. So essentially what happens is as soon as you see two kind of 
uh, circles interconnected by some lines, your brain instantly goes, oh, that's a bicycle. And this is exactly how, depending on this uh, broad strategy that uh, artificial neural networks work in the exact same way. They learn to abstract uh, visual input and store it as high level visual con concepts. And so instead of these biological neurons, which are inside of you, we instead have these artificial neurons, which are connected by these interconnections between them. And let's now try to understand, okay, what do these individual neurons, what exactly is an artificial neuron? And so to give an example, let's say you're trying to decide whether you want to go to some restaurant and you're using an artificial neuron to take this decision. Now there are various factors which are involved in your decision. For example, what is the COVID test negativity rate in that area? Is it, is it too low, too high? What is that? How is the food quality at that restaurant? How is the level of service at this restaurant? And you might have these different decisions might be important to you in different ways. So I have assigned a number which shows how important each decision is to me. So for example, this is assigned an eight, which means that this is pretty important to me. And food quality and service kind of term of come next in terms of importance. And then we have this thing that we call the bias, the inherent bias, which tells you how inherently are you inclined to go out to a restaurant to eat. If you are very inclined, you set a high number. I've set a low number, which is kind of showing that I am not very inclined to go out and eat at a restaurant right now. And based on these, you can take a decision. Now, if I did this mathematically, what I would do is these numbers, these weights that I've assigned, as we call them, I represent them by these three numbers. And then each of these will get an input. For example, if the food taste and quality is very high, I will input a number which is close to one, 0 0.9 or 0 0.8. If the quality of service is not very high, I will uh, assign a low number 0 0.2 or 0 0.3. And then I will do a little bit of mathematical jugglery where I will do this matrix multiplication. And then based on the output, I will take a decision. So here it shows uh, the output, the Z is kind of this W X plus B. So if these X's grow in number, these total Z will grow. As you can see, the output kind of varies based upon this W X plus B. And so for low values, so when the food quality is not that good, the quality of service is not that high, and the test negativity is also not that high, the decision to go to a restaurant or not, so if it's close to one, you go to the restaurant, so if it's close to zero, you do not go. So if these X values are low, then you do not go to the restaurant. But again, as these Xs grow, if the food quality is high, the test negativity is also high, then your decision becomes easier, and you in, become more inclined towards going to a restaurant. And if these increase further, then it becomes almost sure that you are going to a restaurant. So essentially what an artificial neuron does, it, it helps you take logical decisions based on input evidence. And what a neural network, an artificial neural network is, is nothing but a collection of these different artificial neurons, which essentially help you take high level decisions by taking input information and evaluating what each of these input uh, information means. So for us, essentially what we want to do is we want to feed the image of a galaxy into a neural network. And as an output, we get these three different values. What is the probability that this input image is disk dominated? What is the probability that this is something intermediate? And what is the probability that this is something which is bulge dominated? In order for this demonstration over here, I'm showing you a very simplistic artificial neural network. For our actual work, we use something which is slightly a little bit more complicated. Uh, and it is what we traditionally call a convolutional neural network, which are nothing but a slightly more complicated combination of these individual neurons that I have been talking about. And let's talk a little bit about what these convolutional layers, as we refer to them, do. So essentially, let's say you have built a convolutional neural network to identify the image of a cat. And what this uh, networks do is in the very initial layers of the network, uh, if you feed in the image of a cat, the network will try to identify these very simplistic features. For example, can it see the edges that you would expect to see? Uh, can you see the whiskers, which are just lines? Or can you see this triangle, which is associated with typically the ear of a cat? So initially, you're trying to look for these very simple patterns. Now, based on these simple patterns, the presence or absence of them, the high level layers in the network try to infer whether, for example, there is an eye present, whether there is a nose present, whether there is an ear present. 
And again, still based on the presence of these high level concepts, you take the final decision, oh, if there is an eye, a cat eye, a cat nose, a cat ear, then I can say, oh, bingo, there is a cat present. And that's how these convolutional layers work by learning to infer the presence of specific patterns in these images. And to infer the presence of these specific patterns, what we do is we have these things which are called filters and we glide these filters over the images. So essentially we take a filter and we essentially, as it's shown over here, we glide the filter over the entire image, trying to figure out whether that specific pattern is present. For example, over here, we have this filter and it's gliding over the zero to find out where it can find the pattern of this diagonal. And it's shown over here and here it finds that pattern. And at the heart of it, this is nothing but ma matrix multiplication, which is happening. And it's this, in the last few years, this possibility of matrix multiplications being able to be done very quickly on graphical processing units, uh, which are the same things which mine Bitcoins and help video gamers play games. It's only due to this uh, growth in the technology of GPUs that we are now able to do this in other fields of research as well. And so essentially what we do is, for a large number of galaxies, which we already know the true answers for, or we simulate them, we show the network those images and then train them to, because we already know the truth, the answer, the right answer for those, we tell it what's the right answer. And when we have done this enough number of times, the network has essentially been trained to recognize different types of galaxy images. And so does this work? Uh, does this process of training, this, uh, matrix multiplications that I told you about, do they work? Can neural networks identify galaxies after going through this process? And we have uh, tested this out and they do. Uh, the SDSS and the candles are two large surveys that were done. SDSS is ground-based and candles is using the Hubble Space Telescope. And as you can see from these net accuracy numbers, and I will not go into these details, but as you can see from these net accuracy numbers, the neural networks are pretty accurate. With more than 95% accuracy, we can tell uh, looking at a galaxy image, whether that galaxy is a disdominated galaxy or a bulge dominated galaxy. And one of the benefits of this network is while it would take you, for example, a couple of years to do this through a citizen science project like Galaxy Zoo, or a similar amount of time where you try to fit each galaxy by hand using a light profile, it only takes us about a few minutes once the neural network has been trained to process a large number of images. And now you ask the question, okay, but are you sure this thing is actually working? Because aren't these neural networks like black boxes where you're just throwing in an image and you get an answer and you don't really know how this thing is working? That is not actually true for convolutional neural networks. And to demonstrate that, let me show you a few uh, filter patterns. So essentially, you remember a few seconds ago, I was talking about this, how this neural network tries to identify if something is of a cat by looking at these hierarchical level of different features. When we analyze the filter patterns of the galaxy morphology network, that is our network or gamma net as we call it in short, uh, these are the different filter patterns that we see. And these, as we go deeper, so these, from left to right are filter patterns earlier in the network and these are filter patterns later in the network. And so as you can see, these very early layers look for very simple features like edges present in the images. By the third layer, the network has figured out that it needs to focus on these circles, the circular things in these images, which are correct because galaxies more or less look like circles. As we go deeper, now the network has learned that, okay, I need to focus at the center of these galaxies and try to figure out how much light is at the center and whether there is these kind of bulgy shapes at the center, because as, uh, as I was telling you, we care about whether the galaxy is disdominated or bulge dominated. And in these very last few layers, the network is even looking at high level concepts, the sub parts of a galaxy where it's trying to figure out whether it can see these different shapes like spiral arms, which are present in these galaxies. So this, again, as you can see, just like this cat inference over here, the convolutional neural network tries to combine the presence of these different patterns in the images and then makes the decision whether the image that we're looking at is a disk galaxy or a bulge dominated galaxy. Now, as a final test, as a final technique, we also perform this additional test where we feed the image into the neural network and ask it the question, okay, which part of the image did you use to reach the decision that this is a disk galaxy or a bulge galaxy? And what I show over here is the galaxy that was fed into the neural network. And over here is the heat map, as we say, where the redder parts of the image are trying to show you which 
parts of the image were heavily used in the decision-making process. And as you can see from this image, for example, the network uses the fact that there is the spiral arm present in the galaxy to infer that this is a disk galaxy. Again, over here, you see the same thing. It infers the presence of the spiral arm and it says it's a disk galaxy, just as we expect when a human being sees a spiral arms in a galaxy, they refer to it as a disk galaxy. On the other hand, what this is showing you is even if there are these random, like a secondary galaxy present in the image, the network still correctly learns to focus on the galaxy at the center and infer what the galaxy is. So using these inference techniques really helps us to uh, settle on the fact that not only do we achieve high accuracy just in terms of statistics, but the answers that we get really make sense because they're based on strong principles of how galaxies look like. So summarizing what I've told you is that using these convolutional neural networks, we can successfully determine the morphology of galaxies from different kinds of surveys, and we can do it very quickly. What I did not talk about, we can also determine the morphology of Asian host galaxies pretty accurately, that is galaxies which have black holes in them and which are very active. And as I show using this simulation over here, this is the image of a galaxy, and this is the same galaxy that it looks like if there is a very active black hole present at the center. The black hole emits so much light that it kind of, it kind of blinds out the uh, image of the host galaxy. And that's why it's kind of different to infer the shapes of these galaxies. But we have developed technique, we have worked with our collaborators to develop a technique where we, if, if we feed in this image to our convolutional neural networks, it can recover as is shown over here, something that looks very similar to the original image. So essentially it can subtract out the presence of this black hole and then tell us the actual shape of the host galaxy. So what we have been doing now is we have been applying our neural networks over large samples of previously unstudied galaxies to look at the morphology information. And then we are correlating that information with the X-ray information from the same galaxies, which tells us about the level of activity of the black hole in these galaxies. And then combining these two information helps us to understand how black holes and galaxies are co-evolving with each other. Um, if you want to know more about our work, uh, you can head to our website. You can head to my website and you will find links to most of what I presented today. And most of the work that we do is also open source. So you can actually go ahead and use our convolutional neural networks if you wanted to play around with them and just see whether they work or not. And given here are also my Twitter and my GitHub so that you can have a look if you want to. Uh, lastly, I will mention uh, my supervisor and my collaborators. So Meg Yuri, she's a professor of physics and astrophysics here at Yale and she's my supervisor. Chuan Tian is a, a fifth year graduate student in the physics department. And Amrit Rao was an undergrad at Yale here in the computer science department until last year. And all of us work very closely on this work, uh, trying to understand black hole and galaxies and how they evolve with each other. And there's also a larger collaboration which is present. And most of this work is made possible from resources and funding from different agencies, uh, NASA, the National Science Foundation, the Yale Center for Research Computing, and the Google Cloud. So yeah, that's more or less what I had to say. And I'm happy to take some questions now from you. Fantastic, thank you, Richard. That was very uh, interesting. And yeah, if anyone has any questions, uh, throw them in the YouTube live chat and I'll relay them. Uh, this is uh, you know just what Facebook and Google are doing to us, right? With face recognition and uh, you know, if you've ever used YouTube, which you're doing it right now. Uh, YouTube is using these neural networks to figure out um, <laughs> what you should, what they should serve to you to watch uh, next. So uh, I have a bunch of questions about the the research, which is really interesting. Like, how do you train the network, and you know what results you're looking for and things. Um, but before we get to that, uh, could you just say a little bit about how you got interested, uh, first of all, in astronomy? you know, in general, how, why, are you, why are you an astronomy grad student? And, um, and then how did you get into interested in galaxy evolution and machine learning? Yeah, so these are, yeah, thank you for the question, Michael. So for, I, it, it happened in the reverse order for me in a way. So I was interested not in machine learning from the beginning, but 
it's it's very how this happened is interesting. So uh, I did my undergraduate education in my school in India in Calcutta, in Eastern India. And when I was growing up, uh, after I just started my college, uh, my undergraduate education, I took this uh, open source uh, course, which on which was on this platform called edX. And it was called CS50, which is now in fact offered at Yale and Harvard together. So it was this very popular course and I took it and that really got me hooked into computer science in a way. So from these very early days, I had this interest in computer science and I was a physics uh, undergraduate student and I always found it interesting to kind of apply these computational techniques in my research. And my fascination with astrophysics can be attributed, uh, I was, uh, inspired by a few undergraduate faculty members who were at my undergraduate institutions uh, who you know, used to do these various talks in astrophysics and these other things which slowly got me interested in astrophysics and that's after my master's I decided this is what I wanted to do uh, for my PhD having tested out by that point some research in astrophysics as well. And machine learning, how I got into it is another interest. So at Yale, at the PhD program in the first two years, we do these two separate projects with two different supervisors, which is very good because then you get to test out different uh, fields. And when I was doing my first year project with Meg, we kind of started on a different topic, but there was an undergraduate student called Zhengdong Wang who was doing, who had just joined the group. He was from the computer science department and he, was interested in applying these machine learning tools. And at that point, I was on a different project. But since I had always been interested in computer science, I kind of made this jump at, and kind of tried to see whether there is any possibility that we could use these tools in astronomy to answer some questions. Uh, and that's how essentially this kind of synergy started uh, of trying to apply machine learning tools in astronomy. And from then on, we have worked, we work very closely with the computer science department here and at other places of trying to apply uh, the latest models and trying to see whether they work uh, for us. Yeah, all right. Um, about the research itself. Um, so I think maybe people are maybe not aware of just how many stars are in the sky and then how many galaxies you can see beyond the Milky Way. You know, you go out and you look at the sky and you see, you know, in New Haven, you see a few dozen stars and you go someplace where the sky is dark and you can see a few hundred, maybe a thousand stars. But, you know, if you look at a typical survey, you know, there's tens or hundreds of millions of stars. And then of course we know there are hundreds of billions of stars in the Milky Way. So, you know, there are companies that will allow you to name a star you know uh, you can you can buy the name of a star and that's fine you get a certificate but you have to be aware that it's sort of like naming the grains of sand on a beach because there are just so many stars and then you look beyond the milky way and again there are hundreds of billions of galaxies well that might be an exaggeration at least billions of galaxies in the observable universe so you know hence you need robots to look at these galaxies for you to classify them um, so I think that's really important. Um, one question that I wanted to ask about the, the project uh, and with the convolution algorithm where you're looking for uh, particular features like edges or spiral arms or circles and things like that, um, do you have the same kind of training process that you do for like image recognition or, th or things like that? Or like it's there's a famous example where doctors are using machine learning to find tumors in x-rays that are very subtle and very low contrast and the computer can really lock into certain features. So you just have to show it a million x-rays and say these are the ones with tumors and these are the ones without and you don't know what kind of neurons are getting, you know, uh, re, uh, reinforced to show to give the final decision. So with the training for this, do you have like um, do you take the data from Galaxy Zoo or do you sit there and click and say yes, no, yes, no? I mean, how do you how do you do the training for this type of network? Yeah, that's a very interesting question, Michael. And as Michael pointed out, the, the best part about these neural networks is when you have a so when people first started out with neural networks, many of them tried to hand design these different filter patterns. 
patterns in the very early days they would try to hand design how these filter patterns looked like these specific features that what they look like but later on in the last decade or so uh the techniques that we use we these filter patterns the neural network itself during the training process decides what filter patterns it wants to use uh, to look for in the images but as michael rightly pointed out you need to have the correct information for a large number of images in for for you to be able to do to tell the correct answer for example the first thing there is this data set called the mnist data set which is these very uh, large data set of figures of these numbers that were written out i think by sensor workers and high census workers and high school teachers which were trained to were used in training neural networks which could identify digits and these digits it was important because the post office wanted to read zip codes automatically and that was uh, very important so how do we do this for our case so for us there have been many work done in the past where people have used images where we knew the correct answer from something like galaxy zoo where uh, essentially many people have looked at these galaxies and classified them. So that information was used to train these networks. But what we did for our work is focus on this other regime because what you can think about is if we are going to use convolutional neural networks to classify galaxies from future surveys, which have not been classified yet, if you want to do that, then you get stuck in this chicken and egg problem. Because if you want to train your neural network using data from future surveys, which have not been looked at, how do you get that? Yeah. So instead, what we did is we trained our neural networks on primarily on simulations because simulations are free to make. We can make hundreds or millions of them on the supercomputers here at Yale in a very short amount of time. And since we are simulating them, we know the true answers for them. Right. And what we saw in our research is when we use these simulations, then we have to find a very small subset of real galaxies to also do the training. So we first train our network on simulations. And then we refine the already trained network, which has been trained on simulations using a small amount of real data. And because the heavy lifting of the training happens using the simulations, we need a very small amount of real data to go in and train. So essentially that's how we do our training, where we use simulations, where we know the ground truth to train our networks, and then use a small amount of real data to fine tune that training. And thus finally we have a network uh, for which which is very well averse with how different galaxies look like and can give us uh, more or less right answers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me ask just two more quick questions. Let's see. Oh, there's one question in the chat. Um, David says, great topic and speaker. Can you make the slides available for download? Yeah, I'll put um, your, I'll put Aritra's website in the uh, comments for the video. If anyone's watching this after the fact, you can find that. And I can put a link to your slides there as well. Um, so that people can see them uh, if they like. Was this technology used to analyze the vast amounts of data collected by some of the large sky survey projects? Yeah, you were saying you were looking at SDSS and Candle, and you know there's going to be some huge uh, projects at, like uh, the Vera Rubin Telescope, the Large Survey Telescope. That so this is a this is the future of astronomy. Is that uh, astronomers looking through telescopes on some distant mountaintop that's that's the past <laughs> you know now it's astronomers uh, on remote video connections doing astronomy but soon it'll be computers and robots doing astronomy on huge data sets doing data mining and and things like that so let me ask you my two quick questions and if anyone's who's watching the stream live has questions by all means type them in the chat but first of all um, i know you were saying in the introduction that the plan is to use this to learn about galaxy evolution and maybe which galaxies have gone through mergers and maybe which ones have supermassive black holes. So how is that project going? Where are you in kind of the astrophysics of getting results from the surveys? So essentially we have figured out a few answers for these questions. So for example, we currently, if we just look at the galaxies themselves, they also sometimes tell us stories about how the evolution happens. 
because you can look at the level of star formation happening in a disk galaxy and looking at different sets of time uh, and try to understand how they look like. And what we saw when we applied our neural network on these images at redshift zero and redshift one, we could identify these two separate evolutionary pathways for disk dominated and bulge dominated galaxies. We saw that disk dominated galaxies kind of evolve secularly or rather slowly over time where they keep on growing in mass. And after they have reached a certain mass, they quench as we say in astrophysics, which kind of means the star formation rate goes down slowly. On the other hand, for the bulge dominated galaxies, we see that uh, they quench rapidly right after formation, they are quenched rapidly uh, and they become, they go to their final state where, we, where they are not forming stars anymore. And we often call them as red and dead galaxies. So essentially we, we could find even just looking at galaxies without any black holes, these two separate evolutionary pathways for them. And for our current work, what we have been focusing on right now is kind of subtracting this information of the AGM at the host galaxy and then trying to look like, and then trying to look at essentially what the correlation is. And what we have found out till now is based on statistics, there is kind of a 50-50 chance that, again, that an AGM may have been triggered by a merger or not by a merger. So if we kind of look at AGM at redshift one, uh, we see almost half of them in disk dominated and half of them in bulge dominated, which kind of uh, means that only half of them could have been triggered by a major merger. And the real thing is, so this are results which our group has uh, collected over the last two, three years. But the real challenge is over the next two years, we'll kind of apply them on larger data sets. And as uh, we get better statistics, we'll be, answer, we'll be able to answer these questions in a way more precisely where we can say, okay, what is the exact fraction of galaxies that can trigger an agent or what are the exact fraction of galaxies which have uh, disks and how they can how the evolution of them over time is affected uh, by the presence of an agent so that is research that we are doing right now and we hope to have some answers in the next two to three years mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I now I want to go to my Google photo library and just take galaxy and see what it see what it finds see how it's been trained <laughs> okay, well, one, one last question, and then we're going to sign off for today. Um, so, you know, these neural networks are very specialized and, you know, trained to look for certain things. Um, do you worry about uh, general artificial intelligence ever? Do you worry that it's going to take over the world or take all of our jobs or anything? So, uh, so let me, yeah, let me first start with, I am of the view that they're very, so often, you will hear many people talking about this singularity in approaching in time where humans will become indistinguishable from artificial robots. And we are very, very far away from that uh, concept. So let me put it out there. We are very, very far away from there. And what has happened in many times, so artificial intelligence has become popular at different stages of time in the past as well. We have had these booms in artificial intelligence. And the current boom is driven by these convolutional neural networks and these uh, GPUs. But expectations need to be set right. For example, I have this Fitbit on my hand, which is supposed to tell me how many calories I'm burning and whatnot. And if you just air drum for a few seconds, this Fitbit will suddenly tell you, oh, you have walked 250 steps. So clearly machine learning is not at that stage where it's going to take over the world. Uh -huh. But uh, but to say that, that, yeah, we need to be aware. So I don't think there should be, uh, you should not worry about these being some super, uh, superhuman or something that can take over the world, but we need to be aware of the, A, as you pointed out, the biases, the real life biases that are borne out by these neural networks. Because when you train the neural network on a specific set of images, you know, for galaxies, we are very careful to do it on a wide, range of different types of galaxies so that we learn to identify different kinds of galaxies. But for example, it has been shown that if you train a neural network, if you're using a facial recognition software and you are not using a very diverse set of racial uh, breakup in your training set, then your neural network can be very biased. Or for example, uh, if you are using certain parameters to determine loan applications, then you might be become biased just like normal, known, uh, like current loan application uh, procedures. So essentially, we need to be careful about the biases and about job losses and other things. I think it's there are specific sectors which will probably be impacted, like trucking, I would say, uh -huh. is something that maybe will be impacted. 
but uh, I think there should be there should be programs. These are more administrative questions in a sense where governments will sh and should uh, probably run large reskilling re programs where mm -hmm. they kind of try to assess the impact of how that has changed. And hopefully they will change for the better with, I think 20 years ago, no one could imagine that you and I would be sitting on this live computer uh, connection and broadcasting. So uh, like the internet has changed the world over the last two, three decades, hopefully, and it has changed us, changed the world in good and bad ways. Mm -hmm. And machine learning will do, will have the same impact and we need to be careful about how we kind of navigate that. Yeah, I know. I agree with everything you said there. And I think, you know, people who worry about job loss and things like that, for one thing, I think with this most recent revol uh, revolution, the most recent spike, the the more creative jobs, you know, it was like some of the manufacturing jobs that were taken over by robots. And you mentioned trucking and, you know, the self-driving cars are doing a lot of that now. But I think that even more creative jobs like journalists and writers and <laughs> musicians, composers, <laughs> you can find uh, computers that can compose really amazing music. And it's really quite quite interesting to, to see that happen. But of course, we're all striving for that future Star Trek utopia where we don't have to work for our living, right? You can do whatever you want. And I don't know if we have universal basic income or we just have a lot of resources or whatever, but uh, uh, you know that's what we're striving for. <laughs> and so having t the tedious jobs taken over by uh, computers, if I could have a computer do all my grading for me, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> That would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Aricha. Uh, I'm going to sign you off here and um, we'll switch back over to here. So thanks, everyone, for tuning in. That was a really great talk. Uh, and of course, the recording will be up on the Lightner Observatory website so you can watch it. And I'll put some links in the, uh, uh, description, uh, the, the uh, video description below. Um, and so we'll be back here again next week, but at a later time, I think we're going to shift to 830 so that it's dark enough for observing uh, when it's clear. Um, and if anyone has any questions for me, I'm happy to take questions um, at my email. My email is michael.fason, so michael.faison at yale.edu. And the Leitner Observatory has a website, which is uh, Leitner Observatory, L-E-I-T-N-E-R, observatory.el.edu. Um, if things go well, we're still hoping to open uh, to the public again, beginning of August or so, right? It seems like uh, the vaccination schedule is going well. I get to sign up for a vaccination on Friday, so I'm excited about that. Uh, my age group comes up in Connecticut. Um, so yeah, we're hoping that uh, things are gonna improve and we can start meeting in person again over, over the course of this year and we'll have planetarium shows and we're doing actually a renovation on the interior space at Leitner. So uh, should have some new things for regulars who come to the Leitner often on Tuesday night public nights and we'll be able to have classes there uh, again as well. All right then, uh, if there are no other comments or questions, uh, thanks Chris for, for watching and, and posting your comment. Um, otherwise, I will see all of you next time. I wish you clear skies. Have a great weekend. Have a great spring equinox. All right, bye everyone.